Okay, I'm gonna mute myself again. Perfect. All right, well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us for our final um, webinar of the Within Reach series. Um, today, we have two individuals that most all of you know, the doctors Brady and Ann Deaton. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves, but people will be probably coming in and out of this webinar as their schedule allows. I know we had quite a few people who couldn't make it until 4.30. So um, as usual, if you have any questions, you should be able to utilize the chat function um, to send those to me. And if not, you can always email them to us at beatenscholars at umsystem.edu. And now Brady and Ann, if you would like to introduce yourself. Uh, Holly, I, I can't see anything. Am I supposed to be able to? <laughs> can you can see you the... See? I can see you, yes. Um, no, I just see Zoom see, at this point. Can you see the um, PowerPoint slides? No. Oh, now I can. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank okay. You. Perfect. Okay, good to be with you. Ann and I are both here, and we're very pleased to be joining you for a discussion of the uh, role of the university in international development and food security. Thank you, Holly, and Summer, thank you for the direction of the Deaton Scholars Program. Uh, so I will go ahead and begin the session, and then Ann will join us uh, just uh, a little bit later for uh, continuation of the discussion. And I'm hoping uh, to uh, you know, talk for maybe 20, 25 minutes and have ample time for Q&A, and uh, then Ann will say some words and uh, we'll have discussion afterwards. But we wanted to be uh, very informative in this session and, and I must say uh, rather general and focus on interrelationships of the higher education community and how it addresses and deals with issues of global food security. We're still as a community focused on addressing the issue of growing population by 2050 of up to 10 billion people and the challenge to the scientific community and the agricultural community is whether or not we can, uh, we can achieve the level of food production that can keep food historically low priced as it's been and at the same time develop various parts of the world. Uh, I am going to begin by uh, simply recognizing that September the 12th was the 11th anniversary of the passing of Dr. Norman Borlaug, the father of the Green Revolution. And, uh, and the winner of the 1970 Nobel Peace Prize. And his significant contribution to world agriculture is so significant that I feel that we should uh, just in a sense, pause a moment to reflect on that. He was an Iowa farm boy who dedicated his entire life to plant breeding uh, with the objective of allevi alleviating human suffering uh, in addressing issues of hunger and malnutrition and uplifting the poorest people of the world. He believed that the science of agriculture should be taken to the farmers themselves and that they would find a way with that knowledge to enhance the lives of the poorest people and the most food insecure people on our planet. As some of you may know, the University of Missouri had the distinction of providing him with an honorary degree that as provost in 2002, I participated in awarding that honorary degree to Dr. Borlaug uh, here on the MU campus. And his statue has been installed in the US Capitol in 2014. And uh, it's just, uh, he was such a pioneer for the things that we believe so much in that I felt we should call attention to uh, his particular contribution. Let's go ahead with the next slide, Holly. Uh, you'll be changing these. Uh, briefly, what I wanted to do this evening was to focus on the uh, power of the land-grant vision, that uh, vision that knowledge could be taken to the people. In the 1860s, even during the Civil War, President Lincoln had the foresight to look ahead and create the Land-Grant Act, the initial Land-Grant Act, the Morrill Act, that was a powerful endorsement of what the common people could do if they had the scientific knowledge to work with it. And we created with a series of acts through the 1800s and into the 1900s uh, with research, teaching, and extension to develop one of the greatest educational institutional innovations in the world. 
And it's led to the system of land grant universities in this country and to our working with other countries around the world to assist in their ability to develop science and knowledge. And in my work today with USAID and others, uh, the, the, the Board on International Food and Agricultural Development continues to emphasize that, that power of knowledge that must be in every country in the world in order to enable us to, to utilize that knowledge that Dr. Borlaug talked about so that it can really go to the benefit of our people. So I wanted to take a moment to emphasize that. I want to talk about strategic linkages and partnerships that we have around the world to bring this institutional power uh, to the people of the world. And then we want to talk about the pedagogy for understanding the social and economic development of uh, people worldwide and talk about the transdisciplinary perspective that we have have pioneered in a sense with the Deaton Scholars Program. It's really the justification that led to Polyanowski and other uh, co-founders of the Institute coming forward and saying, we need to do something a bit different. And that's what, that's what we're trying to do. So Holly, we can go ahead to the uh, next, uh, next slide. The important thing to remember as we look at all these issues that is one of the great powers of the land grant university, particularly if you have a medical school and a journalism school and all the complex uh, mix of colleges and disciplines on the same campus like we have at MU, we have an extraordinary power to address issues in a transdisciplinary fashion, bringing the various disciplines together in a way that can lead to action and problem solving, utilizing the integrated skills that come together in our educational system. And it's something I hope the students of our university are very proud of. And I know the faculty that I'm familiar with are very proud of what we can do as an institution. It highlights the power of each discipline, the arts and the sciences and the innovations that come from those insights into what we are all about as a human community. And we bring it together to solve problems. Okay, I've mentioned the challenge we have of providing enough school food to keep people fed by 2050 as we approach 10 billion in population. We have been very successful. If you look back even, even a century, you will find a steady decline in the number of people who are undernourished. It goes up and down a bit at times, and we are right now in a con very concerning period where it's beginning to tick back up. I'm utilizing a slide that's slightly out, uh, only a couple of years out of date. If we updated to 2020, you'd see that uptick continuing. We've had a series now of several years of increasing the number of undernourished people in the world. So you'll see all kinds of estimates from 730 to 50 million people uh, to uh, over 800, as this 815, even up to 830 million people. If you think, though, of a population two or three times that of the United States, there are that many hungry people who are undernourished and in poverty in the world today. And it's something that, as a university, we're convinced we have the capacity to resolve those issues and assist these populations in grappling with the resources and bringing about change that will improve the nutrition and the, the ability of people to feed themselves. You'll recall that Vimlindra Sharan, the director of North American director of the FAO, or actually presented this slide when he was on campus just a few years ago, calling our attention to these issues. We we'll have a slight change here. I wanted to really just emphasize the critical importance of malnourishment. So one of my themes when I talk about the integration of agriculture and health sciences, nutrition is so vital. In our work with USAID through BIFAD, the Board on International Food and Agricultural Development, which I was appointed to by President Obama in 2011 and I'm still working with, we've been able to really move uh, working with USAID and the director into a period where USAID is giving a lot of attention to improving global nutrition. And that's because when we look at nutritional issues, for children especially, we are looking at our future. If we do not enable children 
to solve the problem so their parents help them become able and, and nurtured in a way that they can continue to learn, then we are headed toward continuing problems in the world today. And in fact, in 2016, there were 63 million children in the ages of six to 11 that were not attending school. Children that should have been learning. Many of these were due to the fact that they were hungry and did not have enough food and energy to carry them through the day. If mothers do not have adequate nutrition, we have undernourished children and some that are stunted in growth and may never achieve a level of a full functioning human being. It not only affects nutrition of uh, the family and their future, but it affects the, the, the nation as a whole. Uh, Ann and I worked in Ecuador the summer we got acquainted, in fact, in 1966, the year before we got married. We worked closely with a family who worked so hard trying to feed his family. Uh, most of them, he had, he had five children. Only one had survived. And this child was five years old, had a bloated stomach, and it looked very much like this child would not last very long because they simply did not have enough food to feed his family. So we've seen this firsthand, and it's one of the most horrible things you can see. This father was getting up at two o'clock in the morning and beginning his work that he worked on all day until dark, making brick. He had his own homemade brick making uh, machine that he would then sell to the local community. But it was not enough to keep his children, for, frankly, from being malnourished and then diseased and starving to death. And so we can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, this issue is not only one of family, but it's one that affects the GNP of nation after nation in the world. Africa and Asia lose 11% of their GNP every year due to poor nutrition. And the costs of dealing with that, the medical costs, and the loss in productivity uh, globally is something that's reaching, uh, by 2030, projected to reach $35 trillion. I emphasize this point because once this productivity is lost, you can't make it up. Uh, it simply continues to drag down the ability of countries to feed themselves as we look to the future. Next slide. We know that one of the most effective ways of reducing hunger is with agricultural growth, and particularly the growth of smallholder agriculture, and particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, where three-fourths of the children in extreme poverty today are in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, where small farms dominate and can play a great role in stimulating the economy. It can diversify the diets, it can contribute to cheaper food in the local community, create unemployment and the formation of tools and water harvesting techniques and irrigation systems at the same time that it stimulates the economy and generates govern government revenue to help the nation deal with a wide range of issues. So this issue of the agricultural sector being linked into the local economy is vital. And uh, the USAID mission, the United States reaching out around the world, is leading its entire development strategy today with an agricultural growth-oriented strategy. And it's proving to be very successful and having a tremendous impact on continuing to reduce malnutrition stimulate and stimulate more jobs and employment in Africa and Asia, particularly where it really matters. So I've mentioned already uh, that land-grant universities have a particular role to play, and I won't belabor these except to just tick them off because they're so critical. Every discipline in the university making a contribution. Students being oriented toward core values like respect, responsibility, discovery, and excellence at the university, and caring, as Norman Borlaug did, for what that knowledge will do to improve global conditions. We know that innovative communications and outreach is vital to solving these problems. Last, earlier this week, or last week actually, uh, I met uh, with, uh, BIFAD had a meeting, it was earlier this week, actually on Monday. Uh, we had a major meeting and one of the great themes that focused as we looked at nutrition and the impact of COVID-19, the emphasis was on how do we develop more effective ways of reaching people in small communities around the world. 
And we know there are new techniques with new technologies that every aid mission, working in partnership with universities, with NARS, it means National Agricultural Research System of the country that we're working with, so vital, and the private voluntary organizations that work with us as we seek to find new ways of educating and uh, identifying the kinds of policies that can lead us into a continuing progressive uh, pathway to improved economic conditions in the world. We've had great success. COVID-19 threatens it in some ways. We're committed to making sure we win that battle. Knowledge and science wins that battle and brings about the kind of changes that can really make a difference. So I've emphasized, as we look at the next slide here, I simply want to emphasize those linkages that universities, uh, through many collaborative relationships with USAID and universities here and abroad, can work together to solve these problems. Holly, we can go to the next slide, if you would. I emphasize this, these points because it's been a struggle uh, throughout the post-World War II period to ensure that the science and knowledge of our universities is utilized effectively uh, in this battle against hunger. And we have devoted uh, resources since, since the 1950s in a, in a major way, a lot, proportionally a lot less today, but still significant for what the University of Missouri is doing to address these issues. And we've developed new mechanisms for doing it. And BIFAD was created as a result of uh, work in 1975, bipartisan work in a US Congress to create a board of uh, seven people, four of whom had to be linked with our universities and principally our land grant universities to advise the director of USAID to ensure that our university knowledge and science is linked with what we are doing in our foreign policy. And so this is the basic framework then linked with uh, others. Yes, you can go on to the next slide. We're doing this work now principally through innovation labs. I was present with the former director of USAID, Rod Shaw, as we designed the system that now has 25 laboratories around the nation and world involving, uh, I think it's upwards of 70 by now, colleges and universities, uh, serving in partnerships, drawing on the best knowledge that the universities have to provide to, to address critical hunger issues and production issues, issues that alleviate the burden of work for women, give them more opportunities to care for children, and improve the ability of small-scale farmers particularly. Next slide. And I just want to point out that Missouri is very active in this and through the Soybean Innovation Lab, we are a partner with the University of Illinois and Mississippi State University and others that you can see here, Delaware State, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, with the Soybean Innovation Lab that's looked for ways to provide such a vital source of protein for human consumption, for animal consumption, to feed the protein needs, the animal needs that are occurring around the world, particularly in Africa. And uh, Kerry Clark, the director of the CAFNR, College of Agriculture, Food and Natural Resources International Office that we work so closely with, uh, is vitally involved in this and has been a, a major innovator and has gained some national and international acclaim for her work with Treasures which are such a labor-saving device uh, in the African countries particularly. So Carrie Clark deserves accolades for the tremendous work she is doing. And USAID is very proud of her work as we are here at the University of Missouri. But this model is being duplicated in university after university throughout the United States and in many other countries to try to address some of the most uh, significant issues. When we argued for how we would create these innovation labs, the model that I used, quite frankly, for those of us here at the University of Missouri, was our Bond Life Science Center, where we brought in disciplines from all over the university, did not move a college or a department in, but brought in the key thinkers, the key disciplines that can make a difference in changing the world and developing the most applicable science. So Missouri can take a bit of pride 
as we look at these innovation labs. At least I like to think so, and you should be proud of it. So we can go on to the next slide at this point. Again, uh, you know, I, I simply want to emphasize uh, the multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary nature of what we're trying to do. We have to commun learn to communicate across our disciplines. And we've designed a project system with the Deaton Scholars Program to try to get at this issue. And we, we create the working relationship focused on a project at the local level. That local level can be anywhere in the world. And it can be devoted to any part of the value chain of a production process or to a social service agency that is producing the very vital services that we are using to lift people out of poverty, to ensure that they are involved in the most productive way in society, and to alleviate the hunger and malnutrition that goes with uh, the poor economic conditions that can prevail in our own country as well as other countries around the world. So the development process is a global process. It isn't, it isn't singled out for one part of the world or another. We've got to think about it and learn about it in every country in which we are working. And so we've been very proud of the way in which our students have been very innovative, uh, finding ways to do things better, and a framing more intentional processes for solving the problems that every community project faces at one time or another. And I know that's going to be the subject of another major session with the Deaton Scholars Program next week. So in fact, I learned Corinne Valdivia, I believe, who may be on this program, uh, is going to be involved in Mary Lucy and others at the university in this process. So thank you for your involvement in this. We'll go on to the next slide. I'd be remiss if I did not point out that when I talk about what we are doing as land-grant universities and as sources of knowledge, that there is a global system that's been created by private foundations and by the governments of the world, 15 centers around the world, focusing on key aspects of agricultural and smallholder development, of seed development, of, of development in the tropics, in the semi-arid tropics, livestock, uh, on and on with, with major commodities and involving 8,500 scientists and staff. And we want our students to be aware of this framework in every case where this knowledge then is flowing into various countries at the community and national level. They're working with that, that group of universities in those countries, with universities in this country, and with private voluntary organizations and private sector businesses that are ready to make the investments necessary to, to be successful. So this is an important system for us to keep in mind as we go forward and a source of major employment for, as you can see, for many scientists who are involved in these processes. Next slide. Holly, go on to the next slide if you could. So we've been involved uh, as, a, as an institute and with the Deaton Scholars Program with a national group called Presidents United to Solve Hunger. I simply wanted to point out that we have a national uh, group of a, a national association of universities that in a voluntary way are committed to these principles and committed to bringing the best they can to bear on this uh, change in economic development and nutrition and human well-being around the world. And so here, when we work with our students in these scholars programs, projects, planning that we're involved in, uh, we are looking at how every discipline can participate, how they can uh, mentor each other, talk with each other in the process, the individual role that they play in their discipline, and how they can help empower local action to explore the issues of global poverty at home and abroad. Next slide. Holly, do we have another slide here? Okay. Again, I simply, again, in, in concluding what I want to say today, I want to simply emphasize that uh, Karuba Krishnaswamy and her uh, class in the Honors College may be with us. I simply wanted to highlight her course. 
because it grew from the same impetus that we had with the scholars program to nurture interdisciplinary thinking about feeding these 10 billion people by 2020, bringing food and nutrition security to bear on those most in need, and using collective mentorship uh, and global leaders, which we want to nurture at the University of Missouri to go out in a leadership role worldwide. And that really emphasizes the major points that I wanted to make this evening. And uh, I want to turn now to any questions, answers, and clarifications on Anne, uh, uh, who will talk further about aspects that she sees as critical to this uh, issue with students. And then we'll have time for broader question and answers. So Holly, I turn to you for the Q&A. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have about uh, 15 minutes or so for questions specific to Brady's conversation. And then as Brady mentioned, Anne will give her portion of the presentation and then at the end, there will be both questions for Anne's presentation and for the joint group. But if you do um, have a question for Brady at this time, please raise your hand or ask to unmute yourself and we will make sure that you have the opportunity to ask your question. Perfect, okay. Um, hi, Dr. Deaton, this is Melanie Miller Foster. I'm oh, from- Hi, Kansas. Melanie, good to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you again, and thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, one of the questions I have for you is about training that next generation of leaders in global food security. What do you think are the most important aspects of that type of education? How can we not only inspire um, the next generation, but equip, equip them with the right tools and the right skills? Oh, thank you, uh, Melanie, and that, that, is, that is really an excellent question. And uh, I hope I planted some of the seeds for my answer. Let me say, first of all, I really do not believe it matters what you're majoring in. So, you know, we get that off the table. I, I really mean it when I say uh, it's a transdisciplinary world, whether you're in art or theater or genetics or plant breeding or uh, soils. In fact, the, the, the World Food Prize winner uh, coming up in October is a person with a soils background, very exciting, from India, in fact, originally. And uh, I think what's very important is being as good as you can be in your discipline. I think that's very important. You really want to be strong so that you can then reach over and work with people in other disciplines from a basis of real strength. Because strength means you understand and you're more open in more ways to the various sources of knowledge that come to bear on, uh, you know, on what we're doing. What's also very important, I think, is it are the values that you bring to the process. You know, uh, I've emphasized the university values, respect, responsibility, discovery, and excellence. I cannot overemphasize the importance of your personal uh, commitment and perspective. And that doesn't just happen. That's something that grows over time, you know, with the interest you have, with your concern for others, with those, with those things that you think are important. And then, then I think uh, you, you have to have, you, you try to gain experience experience uh, in, in, in learning with a diverse group of people, like we try to further with the, the Deaton Scholars Program. And the Deaton Scholars Program is not designed, of course, to give credit to people. Cariba's Honors Course does, and that's wonderful. But hopefully it enables you to bring together your thinking in a way that you enrich the next course you take. And you are bringing a fresh perspective, and you learn to, to meld those perspectives together. And so I, I think that those are at least the basics. And uh, there, there are probably some other things. I think learning to work together, identifying with a problem, and then moving forward. Thanks. Sort of the beginning of a lifelong quest. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Deaton?
Oh, we'll both, yeah, I was going to say, we'll, Ann and I will both be here till the end, so uh, we'll have other opportunities to explore, explore it further. Perfect. Okay. Um, I have two questions that were submitted in advance that I can go ahead and ask, and then we'll move on to okay. um, Anne's portion of the presentation. But one question that was submitted is the Dayton Scholars Program is something that is at the University of Missouri. What if other universities are interested in having a program similar of their own or would like to replicate that at their university? How can they go about doing that? Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a good question, one we're happy to address. We, we strongly endorse other universities beginning a similar program. And we're also very happy to serve uh, in an advisory role. We're happy to talk with you, to get together on a Zoom session, and to do everything we can to further your, uh, any university's understanding of the dimensions of what we're doing. It actually is a very orderly process and one that we, we try to improve every year that we have the program. And Holly and, uh, and Summer and others uh, have, uh, have ensured that we have a codified system of understanding that process. So it's something that any university can do. Uh, it requires that additional commitment from students. So we're very proud of the fact that the scholars are willing to undertake that learning experience. And we would involve them as much as possible in helping an, another university or campus bring about a similar program. We think it's enriching and we would encourage it. Great, right. and then the last question that was submitted was, um, we talk a lot about higher education and kind of the role that the University of Missouri has played, but that institutions in general can play in advancing topics like this and students. What suggestions do you have for people as they enter the workforce or in their careers once they're past college to get engaged on these issues and to still be involved with them? Oh, a wonderful question. And let me say, first of all, of course, learning never ends. There are so many uh, private voluntary organizations, faith-based initiatives, and uh, agencies that are working with local communities you know, for volunteer capacity. So be, being a very active volunteer is, is a fantastic way to be involved. And then you can continue to learn. You can join in those learning sessions as formally as you want to. In other words, you can do it all informally or you can orient it toward even an, you know, another degree at some point. But the main thing is to be involved and to learn how the organization functions, how it's linked in partnership with others, and how that can be mobilized then to, uh, to make a difference in the world. Every local uh, food bank, every local feeding program, every local welfare agency, every small business for that matter, is involved in one way or the other in bringing resources together to make a difference. And uh, I would just encourage people to be active, to be active citizens. This is a process of democracy as well, where we continue to learn how, the, how these things can be made to really matter and improve the well-being of others. Great, okay, if anyone has um, a question, let's see, it looks like Daniel Foster does. Um, okay. Hello, Daniel. Hey, Dr. Deaton, thank you so much for sharing. Um, okay. As I sit back and work to take all this in and learn from you and think about the journeys that we go on when we make decisions about where we're gonna apply our life passions. I, I was wondering, when did you decide that agriculture, uh, food security, that hunger was going to be a part of your life story? Was it when you were a Peace Corps member uh, that you mentioned at the beginning or did it occur earlier in your educational career? I'm just curious about the origin story. Well, the origins are right and, and, and thank you for asking. Uh, the agricultural interest came from my background. I grew up in a very small farm in the hills of eastern Kentucky and I, I loved agriculture. I loved working in it and doing it, you might say. I used to plow the fields with a horse and mule and go to, go to town in a wagon, you know, pulled by mules. So I grew up with a lot of that in my blood and I liked it. And uh, one of the jobs that I always admired was that of the county agent who got to work, a county extension agent who got to work with everybody in agriculture. I thought that would be wonderful. 
So I began, you know, thinking about that. And when I went to college then, I began studying animal genetics. Then I went to Peace Corps in Thailand. I had the opportunity to teach vocational agriculture and got very in, in, involved that way and learned how we could put resources together to make a difference in every community that I saw. And so I thought that maybe that's close to economics. So I switched to agricultural economics then. And then from there, you know, I went on graduate school, my PhD at Wisconsin, and then have, have, have worked in the field. And actually, I've done about half my work in the U, on U.S. issues and about half of it internationally. I've always had a lot going on with local communities, state and local governments, national government, and then also internationally. And honestly, I don't, as I, I emphasize the point that there's not a lot of difference between working in a local community here in this country and in another country. You just have to learn the people, learn what they're interested in, and be part of that process, and be, uh, be open to learning always. But food, food is wonderful to work with. It's something that will always be with us, and it's always been an exciting. And one of the leading technological innovations, uh, you know, the, the pace of change in agriculture uh, will outpace just about any industry in the world. <laughs> When we talk about IT, you know, look back at what's happened in agriculture, it'll blow your mind, as you know, I mean, the applications. So it's exciting. Anybody Any else? Any other questions? Okay, it looks like we will move on to Anne's portion of the presentation. Okay. And then okay. just as a reminder, everyone, Brady and Ann will both be together at the end, so you're free to ask them any questions pertaining to this or not pertaining to the subject matter. It's totally um, up to you. This is just your chance to have Brady and Ann for an hour and a half. And now we have Ann. Yeah. I'm, getting, <laughs> I'm getting situated. <laughs> Welcome, Ann. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to say good afternoon to everyone. I'm grateful you are all here. I'm grateful you are well. If you're here, you're well. And, um, and also, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you. Um, when the DSP leadership asked me to speak, uh, they said it, the topic was open-ended. Uh, it was up to me. And I'm grateful for that because I anticipated that Brady would cover the DSP mission, its unique pedagogy, um, its special relationship to the land grant mission. Uh, so this gives me the opportunity to zigzag off, if you will, to some other ideas, sidebar ideas, which I hope will be relevant, uh, though different. And I, I hope we'll give you something to consider or reconsider. First of all, life experience has offered each of us uh, insights which are valuable to share with one another because shared thoughts and experiences enable us to maximize the insights from more lives than any one person could live. You're going to experience that truth just by being a member of the DSP. Gaining insight wisdom and perspective from other people's lived experience and diverse backgrounds is all part and parcel of a mentoring experience, be you the mentor or the mentee. And we hope that you will have the opportunity to be both in the DSP and that you will squeeze out of your DSP experience not only the mentoring possibilities that will exist in your team, but those that might come to you through your association with the larger DSP family and um, resource persons you might get connected through uh, your project um, or DSP webinars like this one or DSP uh, inspired readings. So you might have guessed by now that the M in the title I gave to my remarks, and I don't know if you all saw, saw a title, but I had, uh, I had entitled it uh, four P's and an M, that the M refers to mentoring, and that's where I'll begin, with acknowledging the power of mentoring that has uh, served me well in my professional and personal life, uh, during which time I've had the pleasure of um, 
wonderful mentors and, and mentees that I've had the privilege of men, uh, mentoring. And as a sidebar, I will just say that um, I was bragging on one of my mentors so much one time to Brady that I think he just got tired of it. And he wanted to meet this mentor himself and ask him his own set of questions. And uh, the result of that is that this person also became a lifetime mentor to Brady, even when he was chancellor of the University of Missouri. Uh, this, also, I want to say that being a DSP scholar uh, um, attests to a key attribute that you all share with one another, and that's self-motivation. Uh, once you learned about the DSP, you were self-motivated to apply and seize a new meaningful opportunity uh, to enhance your personal and professional development and broaden your skill set in interdisciplinary learning uh, that Brady talked about, collaborative and civic responsibility. Interestingly, self-motivation is also the key personal trait needed to pursue the full range of mentoring possibilities, what I like to call mentoring without borders. I'll begin with um, the informal mentoring experience. It begins with an outstanding person, someone you actually know personally through your current academic or extracurricular activities, your work, your faith-based community, or your community activities. And this is where your self-motivation comes into play. You're going to ask if they might um, uh, meet with you uh, because whatever attribute they have, you greatly admire it and you want to acquire it yourself. Uh, the point here is that these kind of informal mentors are all around you for one attribute or another. Um, including those that you'll meet in the DSP. So who are the people you have noted, noted to be visionary at the macro level or um, great at facilitating meetings at the micro level? Who are the people that gain consensus in a disputed issue, solve problems, people who can plan the work and work the plan, who are effective public speakers, who are courageous in risk-taking and decision-making, who can energize themselves and others to meet a project deadline, something that will become very important to you, uh, who know the golden words to avoid confrontation. You need to approach these potential mentors and let them know you're interested in the life choices they made that have led them to acquire the skills, the attitudes, and the experiences that you would like to acquire for yourself. You can be confident that these informal mentors will be flattered uh, when you tell them that you would greatly welcome the opportunity uh, to learn from them. Perhaps just a cup of coffee or lunch or a Zoom chat, always at their convenience. So you can learn more about the particular skill or attribute they exemplify at every stage of my life, as an undergraduate and graduate student, as a young mother of four, as a lifelong volunteer, as a state employee leading a major state agency, as a spouse of a university chancellor, as an active retiree, as a grandparent. I have not been shy about my ongoing effort to seek out these informal mentors. For at every stage in my life, I have benefited from them, even if I only met them once, whether they were my age peers, whether they were decades older, or whether they were many years younger. Another important mentor type is the anonymous mentor. These folks really epitomize uh, mentoring without borders. That's because the anonymous mentor, like the prior informal mentor, is someone who is known to you, someone you greatly admire, but in this case, you are anonymous to them as a mentee. This is the mentor that you observe and study from afar. 
these are the people who are at such a distance from you societally, geographically, or organizationally, that there is no practical opportunity to approach them and establish an informal mentorship relationship. Here's a personal example. When I first joined MU as an assistant professor, my dean was not really available to me as an informal mentor, but I admired her leadership skills, which fully surpassed my own. And I was self-motivated, really self-motivated to acquire them. So though I didn't approach her uh, to be an informal mentor, I studied her carefully and I volunteered whenever she asked for help with a, a project, uh, those that would get me closer to her, to observe her more closely. It was kind of like mentee stalking, uh, if you will, but I, I think it was legal. Um, I carefully analyzed her decisions on critical and dicey um, and difficult issues. I listened carefully to how she framed her vision for the college. I studied her written communications because she was a masterful wordsmith. I took note of the way she conducted meetings, set benchmarks, got to goal, and held people accountable. How she solicited people's input in meetings and how she reined in people who were ready to dominate a meeting. I learned from Dean B. Dean B. Smith of the College of Human Environmental Sciences that the most important thing a leader does to encourage those in the organization who make things happen is to thank them and recognize and reward them. After observing her in any particular activity, I would always ask myself, would I have done it that way? If not, why not? Could I pull off what she just did? If not, why not? And I learned enormously from this exercise. While all of us, I know, naturally do this sort of thing from time to time with various people, there's a difference when you do it mindfully and repeatedly as I have done over many years with many people who I prize for how they conducted their personal and professional life. Finally, in thinking about mentoring without borders, I encourage you to seek out book mentors. Read feverishly, read everything. Dig deep into books and journals and papers on the causes and the proposed solutions to hunger and poverty at home and in low-income countries. Read history for perspective. Read the humanities for inspiration and insight. Read the stories and the visions of the world's great humanitarians, spiritual leaders, adventurers, political leaders, scientists, and civil rights leaders. John Lewis's biography is a great place to start. It all adds up to clear, substantive, analytical, and open-minded thinking when you read expansively. The more you read, the more objective perspective you acquire. And here's a tip. For an entire six months, pick a person or a topic or a country that you commit yourself to studying in depth. Again, to do this, to get this book mentorship, you have to rely on that trait of self-motivation. I'll give you another personal example. I began a six month study of someone called Gertrude Bell, born in 1868. She lived an amazing life until her death in 1926. And I have learned so much from studying her life in depth from different angles. She was a prolific writer, a world traveler, 
an influential political officer in the British Foreign Service. And I dare say, at that time, she was the only woman in the British Foreign Service. An archaeologist who explored and mapped uh, much of Arabia. And in those archaeological adventures, she came upon um, Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, and she didn't have so many praiseworthy things to say about him when he was doing his archaeological work rather than his leadership advocacy work later on. She didn't think he was a very good archaeologist. She traveled alone through Arabia with a single um, Bedouin tribesman as her guide. She went to places where no foreign man had ever gone, uh, no less a woman. And she learned to speak Arabic. Gertrude is also responsible for drawing the boundaries for the countries we know today as Iraq and Jordan. First, I read her biography, The Desert Queen, then her own travelogue, which is amazing. She's a gifted writer. Uh, she wrote this in 1905, The Desert and the Sown. And finally, I read a novel, Dreamers of the Day, in which she is involved. To this day, she is one of the few uh, representatives of Great Britain from that time who is remembered with anything resembling affection by the people in the Arab world. And I too owe Miss Bell my due for teaching me about the power of the four Ps that I also included in the title of this talk. The first P is the power of perspective. And Gertrude Bell was pushing back, uh, uh, excuse me, the power of persistence. And Gertrude Bell was pushing back on all kinds of conventions of her day. She persisted, persisted to get into Queens College and then Oxford when there was, I think she was in the first class in Oxford. There were maybe just a couple of women other than herself. Um, I believe they had to sit with their backs to the class and um, the professor spoke to the class, but their backs were to the class. She graduated with honors um, in modern history. She also pushed back about the conventional age to marry. Uh, she decided not to because she wanted, as I've mentioned earlier, to travel to places where no person, no foreign person had ever been in Arabia. And it all reminds me of the famous Anais Nin quote, and the day came when the risk to remain tight in the bud was more painful than the risk to, it took to bloom. We must each, like Gertrude Bell, persist despite the risk and pain and open ourselves to bloom in all the ways we desire. The second P uh, is for perspective. Gertrude Bell uh, exemplified a quest for perspective, travel, being a lifelong learner, and reading expansively gave Gertrude Bell the ability to communicate with people who came from dramatically different backgrounds and to come to see things through the lens of their lived experience, and then to find common ground in a shared humanity. And given what we are experiencing in our own society today, it is so important for us to find this ability to look through the lenses of people with whom we might be in difficult dialogue with the third P is passion. Gertrude Bell, Gertrude Bell had a passion for learning and adventure, as you've heard, and a passion to do everything at the highest level of excellence. And I uh, recall that Brady just a few moments ago in answering a question talked about the importance of doing things at, as well as you can, the best that you can. Uh, respect, responsibility, discovery, and excellence. So, um, and she had that passion. 
She also had a passion for social justice concerning how Great Britain uh, was getting ready to treat the people of Arabia. She was determined through her studies and travels to gather the widest and the most close up view of every situation. And her passion gave her the courage of her convictions in speaking to Winston Churchill about her advice in dealing with the creation of the national boundaries we know today in Arabia. Passion is what motivates us to stay the course. From my days as a volunteer with Brady in Ecuador, and then again uh, with Brady in Appalachia as a volunteer with two of our four children, to Brady and my creating a food pantry in our garage, to helping Nick Dragey and other MU activists start MU's Tiger Pantry, to my professional work to ensure that the elderly had food and were not using the money to get food to buy medicines and denying themselves proper nutrition, to my work with Brady and MU's amazing students, like the leaders in DSP today to help develop the DSP, I have been passionate about ending hunger and extreme poverty, passionate to have food, education, and health viewed as a human right, not as a social transfer from the haves to the have-nots. And though hunger and poverty might not be eradicated in my and Brady's lifetime, we are confident they will be in yours. And this passion also fuels my personal philosophy, which brings me to the final P. Though Gertrude Bell, uh, I never read a personal philosophy in any of her autobiographical works. Given the maverick that she was, I would say one of hers would have to be, to thy own self be true. It's important to think about your own personal philosophy uh, and craft one as a bedrock to how you will live every moment of your life. I crafted one many years ago and have always had it at the bottom of my resume or bio or vita. And interestingly enough, I have been asked sometimes more about that in a meeting or interview than I have about anything else. It goes like this. Work to promote good for all people. Be thankful, be kind, and have the courage to seek truth and freedom, and your life will be meaningful whatever path you take. I will close with one of the most inspiring mandates relevant to the DSP and which I gleaned in studying a book mentor, Sergeant Schreiber, who led the development of the Peace Corps under President John F. Kennedy. Um, in the quote I'm going to read uh, from a biography of him, actually done by his son, the biography is entitled, A Good Man. Sergeant Tri Schreiber is speaking to return Peace Corps volunteers but he's speaking to all of us. Here's just a segment of what he says. PCVs, stay as you are. Be servants of peace. Work at home as you have worked abroad, humbly, persistently, intelligently. Weep with those who are sorrowful. Rejoice with those who are joyful. Teach those who are ignorant. Care for those who are sick. Serve your wives. Serve your husbands. Serve your families. Serve your neighbors. Serve your cities. Serve the poor. Joy in others who serve. Serve. Serve serve. That's the challenge. For in the end, 
it will be the servants who save us all. So I thank you for your kind attention to this zigzag, to my mentoring meanderings, which I hope will have some meaning for you. So thank you for being DSP scholars. That was great, Anne. Um, very inspirational. So I'm glad we have that on film because I'm going to watch that again many times. Um, but now we'll open the floor up to anyone who has questions for Anne. Anne do you want to sit here? Just and then sit here. If it's anything directly related to what she said, and then Brady and Anne will both be available together to answer any questions for the next 20 minutes or so. If you have a yes. question, um, ask to unmute yourself or do like a reaction and I can unmute you. Doesn't look like we have any questions yet. So one question that I have kind of based on what you said was if you had to recommend two books, like only two books that you've read that made an impact on you and your development as a volunteer and as a mentor, what would those two books be? So one of those uh, is another book mentor. I have read many books about Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, but one which I recommend to you uh, is Tomorrow is Today. She read this, now, all those four Ps are exemplified in this book, um, and especially passion. She almost dictates this book on her dying deathbed and her secretary is copying down what she says. And it is so inspirational. Um, there actually are a couple of things in there that she has a dated viewpoint that I think she would um, frame those thoughts a little differently if she had the benefit of where society has come today. But by and large, it is a very important book about moral, ethical, approaches to civic responsibility. Another book, actually you can't just ask me to, but anyway, another book is A Life of Her Own by Emile Carl. Emile Carl did not write this book till she was around 75. And again, she herself did not write it. She um, dictated it. Um, she spent most of her life in obscurity she was raised and lived in uh, the Pyrenees Mountains in southern France uh, in a village that was incredibly remote from the world. They lived um, at one point in her early years almost like people would live in caves. She describes it that way. Life was beyond harsh and yet she is determined to learn and she uh, through various and sundry ways, um, acquires knowledge and becomes something almost impossible for someone from her background to become, and that is a teacher. And she returns to these communities to teach. But she also uh, begins to become politically astute and gain a sense of civic responsibility. And she um, becomes active, even though she had no background in this area, and enormously effective when France decides to benefit from the beauty of this region where she lives remotely to put a highway through so tourists can come, come, come through. And that's what gets her activated. And it turns out she is so effective because she is so authentic and sincere and determined and passionate uh, that she leads uh, an effective kind of parade uh, against the situation in Paris. In the end, France does not build that highway. But there, so these are the book mentors. Um, also, if you think about um, some, not just an individual, like recently I read There There, which is about um, Native American or Indian perspective. It's a popular book out right now, but it has led me and others I'm going to join with to study the Navajo uh, nation. We've chosen the Navajo nation to understand in depth, so we'll study for six months to a year, um, 
the Navajo. Awesome. I wrote those down. Does anyone else have a question for Anne? Perfect. Okay. Um, Daniel, I unmuted you, I believe. To be honest, I feel kind of selfish asking another question, but I just can't resist. I hope that the other <laughs> scholars take advantage of this. Uh, as interlopers from Penn State, we're just soaking in all of this great inspiration and wisdom. It's, it's very sincerely been a wonderful discussion. Uh, aside, before I get to the question, as you study the Navajo Nation, there's an extremely powerful school-based agricultural education program in Monument Valley, Arizona, that serves the Navajo Nation. Their ag teacher is Mr. Clyde McBride, and it's one of the leaders for veterinary science. And offline, I would be glad to connect if that's an interest um, as we look at formal school-based ag education and how it hits all different types of populations in different ways and where those needs are. Um, <laughs> Thank you. The question that I have, and I mean this very sincerely, uh, the, how inspired I am at this moment, but you are both excellent role models of something that can be very difficult, I think, and that can cause struggles. And that's um, dual professional successful married couples. Uh, I feel blessed that I married up to a very smart lady who is smarter than me and has a PhD as well. And we attempt to engage and do our life's work and passion. Um, but I guess I'd like to ask what advice you would give on how to manage that kind of those two kinds of relationships, which don't always line up easy. And I'm just going to stop talking and listen because, uh, and thank you again for sharing. Oh, I'll start by saying that I've certainly been the beneficiary of uh, Anne's commitment to making sure my career was a success. So, and it has been a bit in that order, I think, because she uh, she's continued her studies uh, after her undergraduate days, only after I'd secured a position. So she finished her master's in six years. I was at the University of Tennessee, and then finished her PhD in eleven years. I was at Virginia Tech, and then. Uh, so she was interacting you know, with children on the one hand, part-time work on the other, and, and making sure that everything went well for me. Then when I went to the University of Missouri, uh, she uh, took a faculty position really for the first time and, uh, and began to work full-time then. So uh, we, had, we had four children. So, uh, so in a sense, uh, she took that role, but she clearly was the talent in the family and uh, knew she could make it up later on. Well, you know, it, it, it isn't as traditional and selfless as it sounds. Um, uh, I was making a very rational decision to have Brady uh, secure his position first. There was a lot of talk about 50-50 in my era when I was a young mother of four children, and the children were very close um, in age. Um, but I didn't think 50-50 was going to work. I didn't think 50-50 was going to give Brady tenure in a way that would secure our family's livelihood. So I made this kind of rational decision, knowing that it wasn't going to be forever. I, uh, Brady would get established, and then Brady was totally supportive of whatever I wanted to do. And that's the way we did it. Uh, so, um, I know some people say, oh, you put your career on the back burner. I couldn't have had a more successful career in either academia, uh, which I left early because I had some huge opportunities uh, for leadership in the state of Missouri. So uh, it worked well. Now, there are other people that that just doesn't work well for. They, they really need, sometimes it's job opportunities, like in the case of two of our adult children, the wives got the better job first. <laughs> and um, so you then have to deal with that. But um, I think sitting down and thinking of yourself as a family unit, the other, the other thing is um, children come first. Children don't ask to be born into this world. You bring them into this world. And once you bring them into this world, it is your responsibility that they have the benefits of a good home and devoted parents. And so I think sharing that value system, he's one of nine, I'm one of five. Our parents were devoted to us. 
uh, sharing that value system and doing some rational economic thinking because we didn't have uh, any resources beyond our own determination um, is what helped us. Thanks. Awesome. Do we have any other questions for either Anne or Brady and Anne together? And these don't have to pertain necessarily to the presentation itself, but it can be anything. It looks like Summer has a question. So Summer, I will unmute you. Um, I'm trying to get my video here too. Okay. Hi, Anne and Brady. Hi there. Hey, uh, Summer. So I had a question and I have, speaking of mentors, Anne has kind of mentored me on something similar in the past, um, but I'm hoping to just hear your thoughts in general. Um, you've both been so involved in so many different projects and done so many amazing things over the years. Um, and I find that the more I go on, the more projects and amazing things and cool opportunities come up. And I feel like there's just so many different directions I could go. Um, so how do you, if you're kind of multi-passionate or you feel like there's a lot of opportunities, how do you decide where to devote your time in life and in your job and in general? Well, I, let me say that that is always a very, very big issue. And we find it as we counsel with our children as well. So we understand you know, another generation of, of, of how that is. I think beyond uh, beyond as a as a family and congratulations because you're new in the the marriage game you might say so uh, we're happy for you summer got married last week i believe so this is a big celebration for her i think uh, you know discussing it but then making making the choice and when you make a choice really do a good job with whatever direction that is and you know and 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 then your values will work for you you're loyal to us to get that job done but uh, as new opportunities come along you you really owe it to yourself to look at those and and do the best you can for yourself while you're trying to uh, work with others as well that would be my perspective yeah and uh it, of course it gets more complicated once you're married <laughs> uh or you have a lifelong companion um because you do have to have uh, shared priorities. You have individual priorities, but you have shared priorities. And these individual opportunities that come to you, you don't want them to fight your shared priorities. So sometimes it is painful because you might think, I won't get this opportunity again. Now, what I have found in life is that that usually is never the case. When I was sure if I didn't do X, Y would never happen as the next thing, you know, but that has never really turned out to be the case. Things I thought I absolutely had to do then. Uh, other opportunities equally advantageous came along and I kept that bedrock shared priority. So it is very important to say what those shared priorities are. Um, and like in our case, uh, one thing I have always said is I, I have to reduce stress. My kids come first, my husband, but I also have to be honest about stress reduction. And though I'm a type A personality, I can you know, work from 6 a.m. till midnight, um, I, there are things that are stressful and I, I will avoid those even though I may be very attracted to them. Yeah, through, through our careers, we, we've made decisions uh, based on, uh, you know, uh, something that benefited one individual more than the other. Uh, we've let a lot of uh, things go that looked wonderful for one of us, but not the other. And then we made a lot of decisions based on our children, especially, and, and caring for them and ensuring that they were in the right position you know, for, for their education and health and safety. Uh, you know, an example of what I was just saying and kind of what Brady's saying too, sometimes it, 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 uh, it advantaged one person over another. When Brady told me he was going to accept the offer from the University of Missouri to go to be department chair, I said, oh, no, 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 it's been a great marriage, but I'm not going to Missouri. I love Virginia. I love Blacksburg. 
And I couldn't imagine giving, we lived there for 11 years. I had raised my four children there. I just got my doctorate at the university. Uh, I planned to work at the university. I just couldn't imagine leaving. But this opportunity was a really great one for Brady. And as I mentioned earlier, Summer, where are we now? We're talking to you from our home in Virginia. So we are part of the time in Missouri and we live part of the time in Virginia today. It came full circle because it was something we both really wanted, uh, but we didn't miss the opportunity to have an exponential advance for one person's career. And that was an exponential advance, which then led to the provostship and then led to the chancellorship. I have to tell you that among us tonight is uh, a woman who was on the search committee that brought me to Missouri, Corinne Valdivia. Oh. So Corinne, thank you very much. And Corinne was a doctoral student at the time on the search committee. Do we have any other questions for Brady and Ann, Brady or Ann, Ann or Brady? We have just a few more minutes. Well, one thing I, I just want to say in closing, um, and we're always at, if a question comes up, we'll answer you via email, of course. Uh, but the, we are focused on, on issues of hunger and poverty, but we want the DSP experience uh, to be about you too, as a whole person. We're very, very interested in you. And um, I think we might have said this at the outset when the scholars were inducted, that we are here for you this semester, but if there are ways you see we can be supportive of you, uh, we are always there for you. It looks like we do have a question um, from Corinne, so I will unmute her. Hi, Ann and uh, Brady. It's really uh, great to listen to you this afternoon. Um, and yes, we go back many, many years. I remember when I was a student in AggieCon as well. Uh, and I really enjoyed what, um, what you shared with us today, Anne. Um, I had never thought of, about the M and the P's, uh, and I've learned uh, something new and very meaningful for, for the work that we have to do and continue to do, actually. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm thinking about that we had at MU many years back was the discussion are the, the lessons on difficult dialogues. And I think that was really important and relevant to the work that we do when we're working with people that we don't know or we are working on new issues because it allows us to learn to listen, process, and really uh, be respectful of the perspectives of others. And as we want to work together, we have to understand that. So I want to you both to talk a little bit more about that, about those processes and situations in which you have been that actually require that, because I think it's essential to the work that we do internationally, but it's also, we brought that back and we're working in communities in the Midwest also with Latinos and other newcomers and learning that process of listening to everybody in the community. So how, how, how did that come about? and how did you use it in your lives? Uh, I don't know, okay. Um, part of it came about, and I hope it would have come about otherwise, like when Brady answered the question about um, where did his love of working with food or the issues of poverty and hunger come from? We both came from pretty humble backgrounds uh, none of our parents went to high school. Uh, they were low or economic working class people. So when I was given opportunities to advance in school, and uh, they, they didn't come automatically because people prejudged who I was. 
and, and what I could do and what my thoughts would be. And I learned very early that you need to learn about other people. You need to learn about their culture and their tradition and who they are. And when you do, you think about them very, very differently. And so um, growing up in uh, an ethnic immigrant Italian community in Brooklyn, people thought about me one way, um, but um, because that was hurtful <laughs> and because I felt um, they were not really seeing me, I, I knew that's not what I wanted to do. I really, really wanted to be open um, to um, knowing other people, being friends with other people, working with different people than myself. And that's where the an Appalachian volunteer, learning about that subculture when people were stereotyping Appalachia and then going to Ecuador with Brady that's where um, I really saw that it is very important to find that shared humanity and understand why other people are doing and saying what they're saying from their perspective and hurting um, this hurt out there that's there right now that we sometimes uh, are looking for a scapegoat for. We have to be there and, and um, understand each other better. So um, I was never detached from, I think, difficult dialogues of um, how people uh, kind of um, climb that ladder of opportunity in this country. Yeah, I think, and let me, I will echo some of what Anne said because I uh, was engaged in what would today be called difficult dialogues, probably from a very early part of my life because I grew up in a very remote area in Eastern Kentucky. And there was a big division, even in my county, between the people who grew up out in the country and those from the town where more of the upper income people lived, the doctors, lawyers, and merchants, uh, compared to those who did not have uh, education and income earning opportunities. So that class distinction is very early on. I can recall uh, sitting in a high school class when I, I went to the city school uh, because I wanted, I liked playing football and that was the only school in the county that could play football. So that was my reason for going to the, the city school rather than the county school. But sitting with a, a young girl, a woman uh, who said, I would never date anyone who grew up out in the country. I would only date someone who grew up here in the town. So I'm sitting there thinking, well, then now that's very interesting. Well, let me say, by the way, she ended up marrying someone from one of the most remote communities in the county. But my point is that you start realizing from a very early stage how people are looking at other people from very superficial bases. And that then carried on, of course, uh, when I went into Peace Corps in Thailand and I got more formal training in cross-cultural understanding and language training and uh, you know, listening to Buddhist monks, a different religion. I grew up in a very, uh, very uh, uh, you might say, conservative uh, uh, Christian background in which the, the basic values were wonderful, but I kept seeing people not following the basic values. So that I had to start questioning that from the very beginning. So exposure such as Peace Corps or going to the University of Kentucky where I suddenly am seeing different cultures from all over uh, was very much of an, an ex a mind expanding opportunity. And I know all of, all of you listening to this uh, have had those experiences. So that goes on. And when I was chancellor of the University then of Missouri, and had the opportunity to undertake a formal, difficult dialogue process, as some of you may remember, the Ford Foundation actually was supporting a major dialogue series we had. We, we, I, we flourished with that. I mean, we carved out some ideas that the entire university community could debate. And we had huge crowds at those sessions and uh, talking about very fundamental issues even to the point of uh, such things as basic versus applied research and how that could conflict what a faculty member may want to do. 
And it goes on and on. And, and there are different dimensions of difficult dialogues, cultural, uh, value-oriented, religious-oriented, racially-oriented, and, and knowledge-base oriented as well. And people can get as passionate and as antagonistic about one set of issues for one reason as they can for another. And that itself is a, is a very mind-expanding exercise. And I know that in a university community, you see that every day if you're open to it and listening to what's going on around you. But we're all part of that process. We all bring a different perspective. And the only way we will advance is if we are willing to engage in discussing those issues and talking about why we think about them in a different way. And listening uh, with real respect to the way another person formulates their thinking and brings it forward. And none of us do that enough. We're all, we're all too ambitious, we're all too on a fast pace, and we don't take the time to listen to the common humanity that is in every single human being. And, and I would just urge us all to do less lecturing to others about what you ought to be doing and just demonstrate the way you listen and, and bring that humility to bear in the uh, interpersonal interaction that we all are part of. Corinne, we're not sure if we missed the mark in answering your question, but um, I, I think that those backgrounds that we've tried to describe are uh, what were the springboard for our concern about sitting down with all people and in, and in very difficult uh, social crisis situations, including what we're facing today. Um, uh, and it's very serious. Uh, democracy uh, today rests on us finding perspective and looking through each other's lenses, uh, as Brady said, being respectful when someone else speaks uh, but we must come together. We must put our values uh, above our, our ideological positions. Anne and Brady, you actually did, uh, because one of the things uh, I think it's critical, especially when we're thinking about the Deaton scholars and starting to come together to work on problems to solve issues of society, we have to listen, we have to understand differences, we have to understand why people do what they do, and how do we communicate, and how do we build that empathy and relationship. And, um, and that's what made me think about difficult dialogue. So this, is, this, was, this was great, you were right on. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you all, thank you all. Awesome. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And thank you, Dr. Brady and Ann Deaton for joining us all the way from Virginia. And um, I know I got a lot out of this and hopefully everyone else did too. We have, um, this is being recorded. So if you know people who were unable to make it, this will be shared at a later time. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to utilize their um, inspirational remarks, all, all the things that they shared with us in your classrooms or with your colleagues. So thanks again for Great joining. Great to be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. So